Now to our weekly check on news out of the hedge fund sector. The Now Small Companies Fund is an Australian equity absolute return fund which invests in listed Australian companies that are outside of the top 100 stocks. And it's achieved returns of over 160% over the past 12 months after suffering losses of more than 60% during the financial crisis and the market turbulence of 2008. Well, joining us now to talk more about this and the sector more broadly, as always, we have with us Chris Gosselin from Australian Fund Monitors and also a special guest today, Sebastian Evans from the Now Small Companies Fund. Great to have you both here, as always. Hi, Thanks so much for coming in. Sebastian, uh, if we could ask you a few questions, we do appreciate your time. Just firstly, tell us a bit about the fund and also how you, at, at 23, have, have come to be one of the, the youngest uh, fund managers in the industry. I suppose it's a unique situation in a unique fund. It's, we offer, it's a hedge fund that op operates outside the top 100, mainly in small to micro caps. And there's not very many similar products at all in the Australian space. I suppose there is around the world, but not in Australia. Um, I've been at NAOS for three years. I started, I've been in the industry for roughly four or five. And I started as an analyst and I managed to come in right at the top and then I took over right at the bottom. So I suppose it was two very interesting times in my life, in my career anyway. And this is where we've wound up three years later. Okay. Look, uh, Sebastian, first of all, congratulations on that performance on 160%. It was the best performing hedge fund last year. As you said, it's a very specialised area in small caps outside the 100. It's, it's fair to say it's really sort of micro caps more than that because it's more sort of outside the top 300, isn't yeah, it? Definitely. And, and does that give you any special benefits or opportunities? Our investment process, it focuses on using market inefficiencies. So, as you would know, um, a lot of broking houses, investment bank houses, don't look at these companies because they're too small, the turnover is too low. So they're probably valued at, you know, not what they should be valued at, what we feel they should be valued at. Um, we take advantage of these market inefficiencies. We try to time them with catalysts and using a momentum system that we have and try to get them on the way up over a three-year three -year view. And hopefully we can take advantage of these substantial gains, especially as sort of what we feel the top 200 because becomes more price to perfection. People work their way down the risk curve and more money flows into small and micro cap stocks. How much of a risk though is, is obviously liquidity in, in dealing in this space? That was, that's probably our largest problem, especially in the GFC as we saw. Um, that becomes the biggest problem. As, um, you, as your fund becomes larger, uh, you take larger positions in these small and micro cap stocks and especially keeping a reasonably concentrated portfolio as we do. As the market dries up, no one looks to put money into these stocks and if you're looking to exit, you obviously push the price down further and further. So if you can hold out, as we manage to do with a lot of these positions, um, a lot of them have come back. As long as the investment thesis stays the same, these stocks are you know, up four or five times from the GFC levels that they were in but it is the largest risk and we look to hedge that away but there's no perfect hedge for a smaller micro cap position. So on that hedging it's difficult to borrow stock in micro cap and small stocks uh, how do you handle that hedging and to what extent do you go short? Pre, since the GFC to, to borrow stocks I suppose in small micro caps become virtually impossible um, without paying a very large fee. Even now we use managed fund, pro managed fund products, so a top 200 or a top 300 listed vehicle, and we hedge the, hedge the portfolio that way. But even so, you're paying large fees on that. And obviously, if a micro cap falls, it's got a beta that's much higher than a you know, top 200 fund. So at the end of the day, we cannot hedge the risk way perfectly. But um, you know, we look, if we can hedge away a marginal amount of that sort of performance, and hopefully that we pick our stocks on the long side, to a, you know, reasonable, in a reasonable way, then we will outperform over a three to five year period, and that's what we look to do. I just wanted to ask you too about your view of where the market's headed. I mean, how much of an impact do you think that this Henry Tax Review, the government's decision to, to take up the, the 40% resource super profit tax, I mean, we're seeing the effect on the miners today. I mean, is that where do you see the market going, and, and how much of an issue is it going to be for those miners in the, the small caps? Well, in the end, I suppose, does it get voted through? Does it get through? That's the big question. But until then, I don't think a lot of funds, the big fund managers, will not be putting money into this space until they have some form of clarity. So I don't think anyone will be willing to take the risk. No one was willing to take a lot of the risk, you know, with the problems in Greece and the States and China and inflation. So now with another sort of unknown, not many people will be looking to put money into the resource sector. And I don't think it's so much a super tax because the smaller resource stocks, as they start to make more and more money, 
they will still be taxed the same way as a BHP or RIA, and that affects us just the same as would a top 200 fund. So do you invest in that resource sector, or are you mainly in un- industrials? Um, we tend to focus in a mixed bag. Um, we look, we've made a lot of money out of late-stage biotech plays. The recent one was Acrux that signed a billion-dollar deal with Eli Lilly. We focus on gold stocks. We haven't been investing in a lot, a lot of the smaller bulk commodity plays, mainly because they're exploration companies. They look to raise a lot of money continuously, and it's, it's extremely risky even for us, I suppose. Um, so industrials, late-stage biotech plays, gold stocks, you know, emerging producers, that's what we tend to look for. What? Oh, sorry, Keep going, I was just going to ask you, I mean, what your expectations are for the fund's performance, do you think, given... All the uh, yeah. unknowns that are it's, going on at the moment. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, over five years we've managed to do 15 to 16%, which is about three times the small odds. So that's what we look to do for, you know, on an annual basis. The 160%, you know, that's a one-off. The negative 60%, they tend to even themselves out. But we're trying to reduce that volatility and, you know, make it more of a smooth line. So if the Australian equity markets hold up, like hopefully they do, um, you know, we'll look to do the, the 15 to 20% over a three- to five-year view. Great. So that, uh, that's the sort of profile that you have. We've seen some two extraordinary markets over the last three years, mm-hmm. as you say. You know, one where your Lords fell 55% and it's now rebounded. Maybe it's had a tough time over the last, uh, well, the last three months, actually. It's actually a negative year to date, as you'd know. Uh, but you see that there's still the opportunity to make good returns in this specialised sector. Yeah, exactly. I think, but a year ago, look, a year ago there were opportunities everywhere that you know, would have been four to five times cheaper. Now it's a much more, uh, it's, it's a tighter market, and I think our portfolio has shrunk accordingly. And the investment opportunities out there, the, on the risk of return, sort of adjusted, adjusted ratio, you're taking a little bit more risk for a small return. There's still plenty of opportunities. I'd much prefer to be in the smaller micro cap space right now than a top 200 or top 100 where I think many of the stocks are priced to perfection. You're factoring a lot in for quite a few years out. There are so many stocks, though, aren't there? I mean, how do you cope with, you know, researching and, and making sure that you get the right opportunity when there's so many to look at? Yeah, and that, that's, that's a good point. I think we have a special system that uh, it focuses on momentum. It brings up a lot of ideas for us. It's a charting system, so that gives ideas. If we feel they're worth, you know, continuing going through the investment process, then we will. We've obviously got... A few, many contacts and between myself and the sort of analysts that I work with we try to get through as many as we can but I think we only have about 15 stocks in the portfolio and then we'll have about 40 stocks that we closely look at that might you know, go through our investment process and come out the other side but uh, there's a time and place for everything I think as things become more expensive we're finding it harder to find the investment opportunities that we, we want to invest in. So you've got this very concentrated portfolio and it's often said that it's much easier to buy things than sell them. So when do you tip them out of the portfolio? Because you're not a, a traditional trading, high trading volume, high frequency trading fund, yeah. as you can't in small caps. Yeah, exactly. So, so when, at what stage do you say enough's enough, I'll, I'll tip them out and move on to something else? And that's it. I think a lot of people make the mistake of not selling something until it reaches that target price. I think we have a fair valuation that we derive out of our valuation models and as it becomes gets to within 15% of that target we'll already start selling it because you know, half the time they won't probably make the valuation endpoint but if we haven't taken advantage of our gains then what's the point of investing anyway so we'll look to sort of halve the position before it even gets to our valuation endpoint and if it runs then it runs we've still got some in there and if it doesn't then we've we've made enough to cover our position we'll move on in your current portfolio are you able to tell us your favorite stocks at the moment as I mentioned before, I think Acrux is a standout. It signed a deal with Eli Lilly. It's already gone from $0.50 cents to $2, but once it gets FDA approval, it becomes basically an annuity stream, and it, you're looking at sort of 350 to 4 hopefully. So other ones I look at are Regis Resources, um, which is the old Equigold Management, another gold play, and another one, CBD Energy, which is um, now run by Jerry McGowan, who used to run Impulse Airlines. And, and just, uh, I guess, at ones that you didn't think uh, were, were great performers? Yeah, um, yeah a recent one we've had was Capital, um, aluminium extrusion company. Uh, we got that wrong, and I think the building cycle really hasn't kicked off like we thought it would, especially in New South Wales. There's, the land's not being released, new housing activities are just sort of struggling to really push on. And, it, yeah, the investment just didn't turn out the way we thought it would, so we've exited it, and unfortunately at a loss, but we move on reinvest it somewhere else. 
and your broad view on the market? I mean, we've seen this market that's gone sideways in the last three to six months. Do you have a view that it's headed for more of the same, or are we going back to 2000 and yeah, no, I, I hate to even think about it, actually. I hope not. <laughs> I think, look, from an equity point of view, I think fundamentally wise things are good. If the Australian economy is reasonably strong. I think retail, especially the feedback we've been getting, retail has seemed to be a little bit soft lately for the last two or three months. But the numbers out of the States have been good. The earnings numbers have been good. But there is still a lot of sort of macro uncertainty. And I think until you see that resolved, we won't see our market push higher to that 5,500 level, like many have been saying. But... As the Greek issue becomes resolved and you know, Europeans sort of sort themselves out, I think you know, the Australian market has plenty of potential to move higher. But if we don't see the earnings numbers that we hopefully think we should in a couple of months' time, then the market could definitely fall another 500 points. So, I mean, there is that risk then of yeah. perhaps a dub double dip. What, do you yeah, think definitely. the Greece or the contagion from those Eurozone debt could be the catalyst? Possibly? Well, that, yeah, that's the view. I think a lot of, many international, I think, funds are a lot more nervous than we are, I suppose, because they have that first-hand view of what's happening in Europe. I think the Greek problem does stand out, but I think it's, if you don't have to look at Portugal and the so-called pigs, it's, these aren't competitive economies anymore. So for them to pay back this debt and to you know, move forward in a five to ten year time frame is going to take a lot of pain for the people who live in these economies. So, but on the flip side, then you've got you know, the US coming out of a recession and China going as fast or, faster as ever. So you know, you just got to pick your bet and make a view, I suppose. <laughs> Take a view. It's been fantastic to have you in today. We really appreciate that, Sebastian Evans, Portfolio Manager of the Now Small Company Fund. Just before we let you go, Chris, mm -hmm. if we could just ask you, I mean, we've obviously spoken about performance generally uh, last week as well, but just quickly, and any changes in what you've been seeing in the latest performance? Not, not really. Uh, March was, you know, positive, but the ASX had an up 5% month, so you'd expect it to be positive. Uh, hedge funds didn't do as well as that, as they normally don't in those strong rising months. Uh, the equity funds have done best, um, as again you would expect in a, in a strongly rising equity market. April is going to be a different cup of tea. The, the market fell 1.4%, I think it was, so the market's down now 1.3% year to date. A couple of funds we spoke to this morning, uh, some fell in line with the market, some were actually positive, did much better than the market. So I think we'll see that usual thing, that you know, when the market's down, hedge funds don't fall as far, they are defensive and they do try to protect capital wherever possible.